think it's important that we share, that we communicate, that we are open, and that we grow together to achieve. Because we are the voice of what wellness is about, and it's up to us to spread the message. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good morning if you're joining us from the States. Um, I'm really pleased to co-chair this session um, on behalf of the Professional Beauty Group. Um, we are hosting our first day of three of the World Spa and Wellness online convention. There's been a lot of noise out there, hasn't there, in the last month or two months with people saying all sorts of things, um, some of it good, some of it less good. And we've tried with our panel of speakers, um, we have over 70, to pull in those who are actually running spas or active involved in the business to share some genuine inspiration and hopefully very practical advice. So that's our mission for the three days. And I'm delighted to welcome Anita Murray and Pegeen Crowley of the Iris Spa Association who will be sharing their ideas and their journey in a risk assessment and business continuity plan for Ireland. And I think whilst it's for Ireland, there's a lot that we in the UK and elsewhere can learn. Um, before I, I ask Anita and Pegin to sort of tell us a little bit more about their businesses, I'd just like to go through a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. So those, who've re those of you who registered, do put in your, um, your comments and questions at the Q&A button. And if there's time, I'll be bringing those to the full. We are streaming on a lot of multiple um, med social media channels. I think it's about 10, 11 of them across Facebook, YouTube, across the world, and on the Irish Bar Association channel. So for you, those of you watching on social media, welcome. And if you'd like to get more involved, do register via professionalbeauty.co.uk or, or your local professional beauty, and that will take you to a link. It's free and it's quick. So without further ado, um, Anita, aside from you being co-chair of the Irish Bar Association, what else do you do? Thank you. Um... Um, and thank you very much for inviting us to join you. So um, I'm the co-founder of the Irish Spa Association with the wonderful Peggy and Crowley. I have 18 years industry experience and I'm the managing director at the Salon and Spa Company. Um, I also founded the Edward and Pink brand and I manage and work with a number of wonderful international brands in Ireland, including Casey International, Skin Door, Three Warriors, Margaret Dobbs London and Fadua. So um, busy. Um, and thank you. Um, Peggy, what else do you do? Um, like Anita, I'm well, I'm more, I'm more than 20 years in the industry and I would be a spa and wellness expert consultant. And I would have uh, developed the concept and the design behind the first La Mer Spa in Ireland in Adair Manor and many other spas. And more recently, I've got into developing and designing brands, including the private label brand for the Cliff, um, the Well at Cliff brand, as well as a, our own spa brand, Moss of the Isles. And more recently, a very luxurious hand and foot spa in Dublin called Mink has done their own private label brand as well. So busy on all fronts as well. I'm really looking forward to getting the sector back on its feet. No, and look, I would, I, the ladies, have got a, um, a presentation to go through and I'm gonna let them do that. But I'm gonna start by saying, by asking, how did you get to doing this? And I, I'm going to be, don't take this, how, what, what gives the Irish Bar Association the right to do it? And how did you get to do it? Who wants to answer from that? I can take that one, Mark. So, you know, this is an important time where we must all work together as a community to support and rebuild the industry. And, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm in business myself. I employ over, over 30 people. So, you know, it's very much within our interests to really kind of step up and, and really try and reactivate our businesses. And, you know, we're very fortunate to work with so many 
industry leaders that are giving us insights into their own individual markets. Just this morning, Skindor shared their industry assets from Barcelona. And, you know, I think that's what it's all about. We all have to come together and we all have to step up and, you know, get the, the, the wheels back on the road. I think certainly in the UK and Ireland, some people are waiting for government, aren't they? And I think government, wherever they are, and if it's a group, um, uh, even if it's a fantastically managed government, they don't know enough about our sector and and probably our sector isn't seen as the most priority. So we yeah, exactly. as an industry have got to come ourselves. In fact, when we did go to government in terms of guidelines and, and reopening measures, we were told by the National Standards Authority that we were best off developing our own for approval as opposed to waiting for anyone making it a priority at government. So, and that really empowered us and it, it started the conversation and the community has been incredible as Anita says, and the reach out and the sharing of information from the very beginning with, with ISPA sharing templates and building frameworks. And then from there, it's a matter of reading, listening to webinars, building up intellectual property around it and stacking it against the Irish government's guidelines. So it's robust. Good. Well, I think we should, Pegeen, do you want to share your the presentation? And I think let's, let's dive straight in there. Perfect. No, sorry. Will you share the one actually on that you have, Emma? I'm. You, I'm actually. So I know. Um, I might run through just while we're waiting. Um, basically, the, the perspective from Ireland in terms of the reopening and just a summary for how the picture looks in Ireland, because I think it's really interesting for all the international guests that are that are in the room. Everyone's very interested in what different countries are doing. So um, Ireland has basically been closed for business since March 24th. On Thursday, May 30th, our Taoiseach Leo Varadkar extended the lockdown for another two weeks to May 18th. But then he also revealed our five stage plan to exit it, similar to the UK this week. I think there's there's more information coming out there. Um, but our sector is anticipated to reopen in phase four, which is the 20th of July. And while we've every consideration for public health, we're, we're optimistic that a much earlier date can be achieved. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're working at the moment, um, looking at uh, lobbying government, um, you know, and, you know, that's not enough. We need more. We do need uh, the, the kind of a few examples of what we're we're requesting is the, the, the provision of financial support to enable us to uh, source PPE and subvent the reconfiguration and the changes that might be needed within the business. And that's thing for a lot of countries to think about, because, you know, this is not going to be a, we're all going to reopen our doors next week and it's business as normal. We need to think about the long game here and, you know, what's this going to cost your business over the course of the next 18 months? Um, we've also asked the, the revenue commissioners to introduce a moratorium on VAT um, to direct the Department of Social Protection to have the rate of employers' PRSI contributions. Um, we're also looking at the suspension of commercial mortgages, rents, rates to ensure liquidity for businesses, um, funded grants, and primarily um, in Ireland, the government are, are paying a COVID payment of €350 Euro a week to employees, and we need an assurance that the government will continue to support that. Um, so I'm going to let Peggy just track back to the, the introduction there. And um, Thanks, Anita. Thanks. Um, so I suppose just to go back to the beginning, again, the, the Irish Spa Association, we're 11 months old, we turn one next month. And we genuinely had to come together as the first official body to represent spa and wellness in Ireland, as there was no one to go to to ask about inclusions for people with cancer, insurance rates rising. Um, so we just came together ourselves. We, we basically have critical issues, growth, sustainability, 
professionalism, inclusivity as our objectives, but certainly in the last seven weeks, it's been COVID-19 and, and business reactivation. We are a not-for-profit association. We're a team of 18 volunteers. We work together with some of the leading operators, spa operators in Ireland, and we're very grateful to have them working with us. Um, in terms of building educational resource, benchmarking, regulation, that is where our investment will go towards. Um, we're very lucky that our membership is growing. It's doubled in the last six weeks, which has been wonderful. Um, we're developing salon and international memberships alongside it. And we're very lucky in recent days that, that hospitality affiliates, including the Irish Hotel Federation and Fall to Ireland, have come to us in terms of guidance within our sector for hotels. So that's been wonderful. Um, we started our journey, I suppose, was a moment of paralysis at the beginning where you just kind of think everything's shutting down all contracts are closing all spas are, are shutting down and you kind of wonder what's going to happen next and then we began by by trying to ask the right questions and very lucky for us um our friend and colleague Neil O'Connell is the vice president for wellness and guest experience at the Rosewood Hotels in Hong Kong and they had opened for a brief period between the 1st and the 15th of March they'd had a reopening before the second wave came in and it was just so interesting speaking to her about the insights and the appetite of guests and the capture rate from the hotel and what treatments they wanted. So she agreed to come on a call with us and we were lucky enough to have over 100 people on that call. And really from that, from her insights and her understanding of where the market stood at that time, we were able to build up a business continuity workbook to focus on while spa managers and salon owners were off in terms of viewing their businesses with perspective now, streamlining work process, menu engineering, working with suppliers and partners, understanding the flexibility there and really focusing on cash flow and budget. Um, she was very interesting in the ongoing communication with customers and in terms of the communication on reopening and hygiene and sanitation. And she was ahead of the game in terms of us understanding the new normal market, how the local um, repeat business will be so much more crucial. Um, it will be regional. People will be driving to the hotels and spas versus flying in. So it was, a, it was a wonderful call. We caught up with her before we had our second call last week. And they reopened on Friday, just gone. And the system only went live for appointments three days in advance. And by the time we spoke to her on Thursday morning, it had been live for a day and she already had 30 bookings on her system. So she felt there was an increase in appetite since their last reopening, which was very positive. And it was mainly regular local clients as opposed to hotel guests. Um, she was surprised because there was a stronger demand for massage especially and facials whereas before people had tiptoed in having manicures and pedicures whereas the second opening there was there was more confidence the therapist to the left there as you can see on her team um they were fully masked uh, at plus goggles but no gloves um and the guests although nervous she said they were appreciating the extra hygiene precautions did she talk about occupancy levels at all she did. She said the hotel was possibly 35 to 40 percent and that the capture rate within that was about 25 percent. So it's still hotel was slow, but local business was high. So it was interesting. Um, what what was most interesting, she said, and what's very positive for all of us is upon the guests leaving, having had the treatment and being inspired with confidence, they were buying a lot of gift vouchers. So the bulk of her revenue was actually coming from gift vouchers post treatment, um, which is very positive, I feel. I mean, um, again, I, I, I'm, I'm going to interrupt because I think I, it's going to throw, you might do tell me to shut up if you've got it um, coming up later in your presentation, but some people would say, look, at 25% occupancy, I can't afford to open. Um, I think I think the say, lead time. I think what's more interesting there, Mark, is the lead time to opening that they that, that they were given governance to open, and then there wasn't much time to promote it and drive it. So it was very short lead time, and that's why she was surprised herself. They wanted a slow, soft, learning opening rather than I wouldn't take that occupancy as business occupancy as norm uh, as the new normal I would take it as an opening weekend where they're taking their their time at it yeah so in other words it's an opportunity to build 
Um, and I don't suppose you've had any feedback that has, if that has built. We haven't cut, I caught up with her. What was interesting that we spoke about as well was the pool and the thermal. Her thermal is closed in terms of steam and sauna, but the pool is open with social distancing at 1.5 meters. So she said they might look into making that a bookable, that even using the pool might be a bookable um, experience versus just turning up in your robe and slippers. So she's still, they're still finding their feet. It's kind of they're living and learning every day. And that's why I wouldn't look at capture rates or, or occupancy just yet. I think there, there is a moment where they have already opened and had to close, which has costs. So they don't want that to happen again. So they're being very careful. Um, I will, I mean, is it the view of your members and, and your consultation is that the general view or is it split that people should open when given the, the opportunity um, on the basis it's, it's to, it's a great way of building business. You've got to start from somewhere or is it, or do you feel that we, that business, obviously it's an individual business decision, but is it your, is it the, the view that one should open um, as soon as possible? I think every business will be different. And even in Ireland, as I'm listening to different webinars, um, for some businesses opening in July or August and, and building slowly into a season where they're going to be low and not very busy for some of them they might wait till february march just simply as the investment for reopening they'll be you know there's talk of a second wave of the flus in october and november that people are nervous of so every business will assess it differently depending on the seasonality and depending on you know the, the corporate business people in in corporate travel because everyone has survived this period on Zoom and doing what we're doing now virtually, um, businesses will be pulling back on the cost of travel and trying to do an awful lot of business in this way. So corporate market will have reduced, your leisure market will be domestic and regional. Um, every, every hotel spa, now high street is different, but if we're just looking at this from in a hotel context, I would say to you, some will open and do well domestically simply because others have decided to wait till February or March. So it's, it's, it's a win for some. I, I don't know how it's gonna play out yet, but it's an interesting way of looking at it, yeah. Again, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, one more question, I'll let you carry on because I know you've got a lot uh, um, to get through and it is a really interesting presentation. So I want to give you the opportunity to share it, but there's, I had an anonymous question to them, whoever, whoever has given it, but I will read, I will ask the question because this questionnaire saying, look, Actually, there's groups of salons and spas who don't want to reopen earlier um, because they feel that clients will feel it unsafe. Um, how do you how do you answer that? I, I'm a firm believer in in when you're confident, if you feel equipped and if you feel confident and your your business. To me, your clients, when people are reopening, there, there will be some that open and don't open. And at the risk of not opening and your clients going somewhere else and finding it very satisfactory, it's, it's about being equipped, working to guidelines, working through checklists and wanting to be open and believing it's safe to be open and being assured because, you know, and even at the ISA, it's not just about handing out risk assessments and and doing checklists it's about building an accreditation that you submit that homework it gets reviewed it gets audited and that you feel confident yourself that there's a second pair of eyes looking at it and asking you the right questions so it is a confidence issue but certainly from a commercial standpoint every business should be looking to equip themselves with the information to open and i think your clients will follow you i think we need to meet their needs. We need to see what they're needing. Like it's as Anita said earlier, we talk about this new normal. The client has changed in this time and we need to meet that. So we, we've all suffered fear and paralysis during this time, but we've all come through it. And I think confidence is a big thing. Knowledge is key and not forgetting our place that we're needed. People need us. So yes, and, and I think that. when you go through the presentation, you look what I think what people there is a counter argument which I, I is also that there are the cowboys and cowgirls who are operating yeah. 
I mean, the I've Black seen Marcus. Sunday papers, the UK sun, Sunday yeah. papers are saying these people are operating and that at least you provide the guide, decent guidelines. And but if also we need to, to educate the end consumer that the black market is dangerous, that they're not equipped to administer, you know, Botox, microneedling, insurance. They, you know, we have to, to educate the end consumer that that, that it, already with hair, I mean, we're laughing, you know, if someone has their hair colored, you're almost looking at them now saying, who's doing, you know, we're intrigued, but we, we also need to educate the end consumer that it's not safe. No, indeed. Um, carry on. It's a great presentation. Sorry. Well, I'm going to hand over, I'm going to hand over to Anita now, who's going to just take you through Ireland and the position we're in now. So thanks, Mark. Um, I, just to add something onto that last point, I think we also have a part to play ourselves in increasing consumer confidence. And I think the black market was there long before COVID as well. So, you know, it's not a case that this is something new, but definitely we have all of a part to play in educating um, the, the client that, you know, look for what to look for and, you know, um, you know what, what spas are going to have accreditation and training and, and raise that level of awareness. So in terms of reopening Ireland, we've covered those points and I might just jump straight into our core objectives. And again, it's kind of feeding back into that last point. Above all, we are ensuring the health and safety of our community, our employees, our guests, our customers, and our friends and our families. And that always must be at the forefront. We're not looking to, to reopen our doors from a commercial perspective. There's a lot of, of things that really need to be considered here. So yes, we must enable the commercial sustainability of our sector. There's over 25,000 people directly employed across it and securing those jobs as well as the many additional considerations such as you know the real ripple effect that will be felt right across tourism and hospitality if the spa and um, beauty and wellness sector is unsupported and um, you know now more than ever uh, people are focused on living a healthy lifestyle and our industry will play a vital role in the recovery process and um, not just for Irish people but for people all over the world um, and as the COVID crisis has reminded us, the health of those in our country cannot be taken for granted. Um, so risk assessments, uh, detailed risk assessments will be essential. We've prepared a framework for this. Um, you know, the agility of your, your company to quickly identify and respond to new risks is what's going to determine its livelihood, as well as that of your, your company as a whole. Um, this global crisis has certainly brought that lesson to the forefront. Um, you know, and this is constantly changing and evolving, and as should your compliance programs. Um, the, the, the kind of next thing then that, that we are covering is your, your checklists. These will be essential tools. Uh, we want them to be user-friendly and, and identify the, the range of issues for businesses to consider in responding to the, the outbreak and, and future proofing as well. Um, so uh, in terms of our resource partners then, um, we're very fortunate to have established, um, just on the, the next slide, we've just detailed, just to give people a little bit of an idea. I know you asked us, Mark, initially, you know, where we're sort of drawing on, but we're very fortunate to have established a wonderful network of leading resource partners and experts in every individual area. So we can really lead with confidence. Um, you know, companies like Gary Ainey, Beautiful Jobs, Peninsula, they've just been so generous with their with their time and with their, um, you know, their, their resources. And it just is enabling the whole sector to get back on their feet. Um, are the, the, do you have the next slide, Peggy? Is that moving? Yeah, so that's the, the resources there. So the, the HSC, um, NEFIT, these are all kind of Irish organizations, but as Peggy mentioned earlier, you know, you have ISPA, ESPA, all these incredible um, authorities that are really just stepping up. The World Health Organization as well is, is really leading us with, with a lot of, um, uh, of, of items. Um, I just wanted to quickly show you a slide to introduce you to Dr. Patrick Tracy. So um, we're very fortunate to have a wonderful chief medical officer steering us, and particularly at a time where a lot of measures we're looking at need to be medical led, you know, and, 
myself and Peggy are not going to be the expert in that area, but Dr. Tracy was awarded top aesthetic practitioner in the world, the My Face, My Body Global Awards in the US last year, among dozens of other accolades and awards he's been honored with. And this is giving our community huge comfort. And, you know, uh, I think that it's, it's something that could be looked at all over the world for anyone else tuning in that, you know, to, to really kind of look for evidence-based principles. And, and if you can get support, like the support Dr. Patrick is lending us, I think that will go a long way. Um, Anita, I don't know if it's me, but I don't, I, I don't if you want to, Perhaps hold your video. I spoke to you. Dr. Tracy this morning and some today. This is day. Got me? Okay. Yeah. Just your yeah. sound went. Sound Perfect. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. You're back. Great. Uh, but just seeing as today is International Nurses Day, I thought it was interesting. Did you get the point about um Florence Nightingale? No. So um her key nursing. Okay, so just Dr. Tracy mentioned this this morning. I thought it'd be interesting, seeing as the day that's in it, it's International Nurses Day. So her key values focused on maintaining good hygiene, regularly washing hands and carrying out evidence-based principles. And I thought that was so interesting and it widely echoes this past few months. And I think we can all, I know we're not medical professionals, but it's relevant to us all, it really is. Um, so I'm gonna jump straight into our blueprint. Is my sound okay? Yep. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. So we're really pleased to share this blueprint with you. And for anybody that's joining us that might've been on a previous call, some of this might be repetitive, but um, you know, uh, we understand that an inevitable lead in time will be required to prepare staff and premises and ensure physical distancing layouts and other resources are sourced and available. Um, and we also are kind of aware that that government would need a roadmap if we were to have the opportunity to open our businesses earlier. And um, so we've spent the last um, six weeks preparing a blueprint for business continuity. Um, uh, Anita, can I, sorry to cut in, why don't you temporarily take off your video? When we do return to work, we can do so on what we're doing now and what we're planning. Sure, okay. It might help the sound, not that we don't okay. want to see you. Is that better? I think yeah. so. Let's Thanks, try. Mark, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on, Anita, sorry. Now we've lost her. Peggy, why don't you- I'll pick up for her. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what we've built is, I guess, beyond all the templates that have been floating around, we've had to stack this up against the is Irish- Does it sound better? Can, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Brilliant. So no, Anita, it's still crackling. Can you hear me? Yeah, go again. Try again. You want me to jump in? Yeah, jump in there, go. Okay, great. Uh, so the, the number one um, is the risk assessment. And, you know, I'm sure there's nobody on here that, you know, is going to be a fan of red tape or any bureaucratic barriers that are going to strangle your business and your growth and productivity. Um, but most companies will have to prove they have a risk assessment around working conditions in the salon or spa with COVID in mind. Um, you must ensure that you can show that the necessary steps are being taken as far as, as reasonably practical. Um, Mark, you asked me a question on the, the employer. And this is why this is very important because um, you know the overriding principles should be safe, rational, evidence-informed and fair and open approach. And you know, as a manager or a spa operator or salon operator, as long as you have you know a good framework in place and a good risk assessment, um, you know, you're going to 
to identify any of the pitfalls and you know you can reasonably maintain your your business continuity so where the risk assessment identifies wearing of gloves as a requirement of the job and adequate supply of these should be provided um, and staff must be instructed on how to remove these carefully in order to prevent contamination. There's an interesting slide later on that we'll share with you on that point. Um, and above all, it must be understood that gloves are not a substitute for good hand washing. Um, we would welcome the widespread use of the assessments that we have in place to really raise the standard at this level. Um, another area is now our, the blueprint is very comprehensive. We're just touching off the kind of key points that that people might find interesting. Returning to work, what we should be doing right now, start thinking about business continuity and return to the unoccupied premises, common issues. Um, according to our consultancies would be Legionella, pest control. Um, you know, you might think your spa or your business is clean, but have, you know, you need to have the documentation to validate and verify that. Um, and, and the documentation is really, really important here. You have the reverse burden of proof. So if in six months you're asked about a cleaning rota and if you don't have it in place, um, you're not going to be able to prove it was in place and that's where the difficulties might arise because you know there's there's an element of unknown uh, as we begin to reopen our businesses as well infection control hygiene policies and procedures again are very very important preparation is going to be everything and um, summarizing some employers uh, considerations you're taking a look at stress management workplace stress specific codes of practice within our spas and salons observing social distancing guidelines. How's your business going to implement that? Um, a review of your employees that might be considered more vulnerable, higher risk um, expectant mothers, for example. Then your hazardous substances, you will have an increased use of cleaning agents. We're gonna be using a lot more chemicals. Um, you know, there's the chemical code of practice 2020 that's been launched we're, we're going to be um looking at that as well we're using different sanitizers so foams bleaches um, and we're supporting members with and provide you know a free one-to-one -one consultation via a, a video call with our health and, health and safety consultant and uh, that just gives a good starting point and takes the stress out of it all is my sound okay it's, you guys getting me? Yeah, it's okay so far. Just so I don't speak for half an hour and then you tell me no one could hear me. Um, so we liaise with a company called Peninsula for expert consultancy in this area. And this is where we want to really just go that step further. We don't want to just provide these templates and run. We want to, we've engaged with, you know, really the authorities in these areas. You, you might be familiar with Peninsula. I think they're in the UK as well. Um, but the next um, slide then, just an example of a risk assessment or a SWOT, uh, sorry, Peggy, uh, it's one down. Um, just an example of a risk assessment or a SWOT analysis of your treatment menu. Um, ultimately, if you can't adhere to and observe social distancing, you're gonna have to have a risk assessment in place. This is just a sample now, but you know, um, you're, you're going to be looking, every business is going to be different depending on you know the luxury of space that you might have or the provision of masks and gloves and the nature of the treatment. Um, so it's just food for, for thought. Um, the next slide then, the treatment menu, um, you know, how is this going to look? Um, and the first step is to complete that SWOT analysis and to identify the treatments that are going to be a little bit more difficult to begin with. And from there to promote and um, re-engineer your treatment menu and also developing your low to medium risk treatments as you begin to reopen your doors. And we need to explore new revenue streams as well. Um, you know, I don't think that, that there's any concerns that when we reopen our doors that the business is not going to be there but I think that you know the need will remain but the interface will change so um that's something we really need to to look at but we would say look at um you know stress management counseling introducing shorter express treatments and um, machine facials uh, you know companies like 
you, you have your, your casey treatment systems and um, hand treatments and um, you know i think we can be really creative um, the next slide then is insurance um, and you know this is also important and this is also changing all the time is there cover if not why not um, I work with a company in my own business called Brian Mullins Insurance, and they've been steering us as well. And they, they specialize in beauty and spa. So they're, they're, they've been very, very helpful. Um, but um, while policies differ, under standard policies, the business interruption section does not include forced closure. So in most cases, our policies were based on a specified list of diseases, which COVID-19 was not listed, of course. Um, so the outcome was deemed that no cover was in place. Um, so a policy may provide an extension under the business interruption section for notifiable or infectious diseases. However, for a, a claim to be successful, there must be, a bur there must be proof that any outbreak occurred on the premises, which again was, was not really the case for, for most businesses. So in short, um, because COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic, it's unlikely that any insurance policy would be able to meet the demands of the floods of claims. Um, but, you know, moving on from there, you know, what you need to do now, unattended properties, you need to make sure that you're, you're in touch with your insurance company as the lockdown measures, uh, you know, are extended. A big exposure is uh, the continuing requirement of you to engage with your insurer and let them know that, uh, you know, the premises is empty. Uh, or vacant and um, in most cases the insurer will maintain the full policy but providing that you're keeping your gas water mains disconnected the electricity has to be disconnected and um, you're, you're supposed to check on your premises weekly so make sure you're reaching out to your insurance companies and that that you're doing all that's required of you um, employers liability is another area we're all working from home make sure if necessary your policy is extended to cover any activities that are away from the, the premises. Um, then we have our defence checklist and this is in place to maintain awareness and information and your preparedness for trading during what's going to be more challenging times. Um, advanced planning is key. So your checklists and your documentation is going to be essential to keep on top of your staff policies, your training, and to educate your staff about updated sanitization practices. Um, and really importantly, handling um, you know, the customer about those practices and educating the customer so they're, they're, they know what to expect when they come in. Um, the other area then is the use of PPE. Um, this is going to be difficult because obviously the, the pricing has increased exponentially but um you know and i know the jury is out for a lot of people still on ppe but ultimately if you're unable to maintain social distancing serious consideration needs to be given to this area for business continuity and to satisfy staff and the customer you're you're looking at screens gloves um uniforms, uh, aprons, um, and then, you know, we can still maintain our core of hospitality, well-being, care, and even luxury by adopting beautiful welcome rituals, you know, cleansing the hands with incorporating essential oils and disposable hot towels. Scrummy is a fantastic company that's making biodegradable disposable towels, and, and that's an interesting area to explore. On the next slide there, um, you're looking at the the, 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 this is from the Lancet um, study and the masks, uh, we're, we're talking about the COVID living on them for seven days and that's frightening, but it really just brings home the importance of performing proper training with your staff, how to remove them, how to dispose of them. Um, there's just a little snippet there from the Kapinski group um, beautiful uh, hotels um, and this is something really creative they have done and it's it's kind of nearly introducing an element of, of luxury into it that I'm protecting you any 
Asia, you do in Asia as well, where really reassuring the guest and reassuring the. How, do you have me? You're yeah. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Um. So I think that um the have you got me? Yeah. yeah. Um. HR, we've excellent communication templates that Peggy and will discuss as well shortly. Um, in terms of recruitment, we work with beautiful jobs and Maria, our committee member, is, is fantastic and she's got incredible experience. Um, no, can't hear you, Anisha. With, with guiding the, the businesses to, you know, when you're, you're bringing your staff, jump into the next slide, Peggy, and just think, but just... Um, you have a better line, the hygiene and sanitation. So I'll just let Peggy jump in there. I'll jump, I'll jump in there. So I'll tell you now, once we started building resources, so what we what we hope to do is along with the blueprint is build up a library of resources so that um you know, who will supply the best disinfectant and so on, disposable couch covers. So when we first started our journey, there was one person who shone through like a beacon of light and it was Mehmet from Garieni. And he basically gave us countless hours on the phone working through autoclaves, sterilization methods, tools, so on. So, so we're very grateful to Garieni for partnering us with us on that. And, and certainly in terms of developing information and education around the difference between barbicide and sterilizing, um, using an autoclave, all of that is, is so interesting and we have to learn it. And as a resource, it'll be stacked up on our library. Um, in terms of Eco Lab, being a partner, um, they've been fantastic at building modules that are specific to um, spa, pool hygiene, different, different surfaces, as you saw on Anita's slide there, the, the virus lives for longer. Um, so making sure we're cleaning the floor, cleaning the face cradle, that we've wipes, that we're not spending all day at it between treatments, that we have fast acting, um, quick sanitizing and disinfectant chemicals. Um, and then you have to look at uniforms, linen and performance of, of, of killing, you know, and, and proof of, of the, uh, the efficacy of the product against COVID-19. So Ecolab have been incredible, um, building guidelines, um, pool and spa. Um, the next, I'm racing through the slides now, sorry guys. Um, in terms of communication, which is key, because the balance of all of this lies in our hospital grade sanitation, as well as communicating this to customers, but most importantly, letting them know we haven't changed. We are still here to mind you, we're not a hospital, we're not, um, medical in fact we're the wellness response to what they've been through which has been highly medical so um we really need to make our guests aware that there will be masks and gloves um but we really need to look at it through the lens of why people go to a spa in the first place and go back to communicating the benefits of spa and how spa can be even more to them now in terms of even non-touch coaching stress management um we can't start looking or feeling medical we have to inspire confidence and we have to find a balance in doing that. We must address the emotional and spiritual needs that don't get addressed in the medical community. And that this is the dialogue we must now go to for everyone's benefit. Um, we've had huge support from Premier Software. Um, both Robert and Laura gave us countless hours on the phone. We were very lucky to have Michelle Ryan from Ashford Castle, who would be a leading award-winning spa manager um, in Ireland. And in terms of working on templates we began with the hotel spa template and laura and rob were excellent in helping us our objective was to help the client understand the new normal in the spa prior to arrival um very much about the email going out in advance which would include treatment confirmation health questionnaire covid19 declaration your d your gdpr tick box your treatment disclaimer and a signature, but making that feel like a wonderful welcome note. And that's where Robert and Laura were absolutely excellent. Um, where they were also brilliant is in terms of the tech that Premier Software 
could adapt with contact tracing, understanding what guest had come into what treatment room, had what therapist, and sat in the relaxation room next to what guest. So, so that's that's amazing tech to have in a in a recovery situation where COVID has entered the building. Um, the email looked very much like um, managing the communication reminders prior to an appointment. Um, making the kind of aware of their responsibilities to protect themselves and others, um, having a detailed guide to using the spa and what precautions need to be taken by the therapist and client, your social distancing guidelines, appointment times and managing capacity within your space is very important. Um, hotel guests being encouraged to arrive in their robe and slippers to reduce changing room um, restrictions to pool and thermal to be advised on that email as well. And changes, this is an important one, changes in policy to waive any cancellation fees if the client believes they may have symptoms. The last thing we want to do is penalize people if they have a cough or a slight temperature and they think they're gonna be charged 200 euros. So we have to manage that as well. Um, links to electronic consultations and a request that the clients log in prior to arrival to declare. Um, and even the timeline between that, do you do that? Do, is it 24 hours before? Is it three days before? All of that is up for discussion at the moment. And very much about just advising guests to bring their own reading materials, just, just making them aware of how different it will be, but that we're doing everything to ensure their comfort and safety. Communication in Ireland, certainly the posters have been very bright and yellow and I don't think any of us will choose the color yellow after this, but certainly where we want to work as an association is we want to build signage that is comforting, is educational, that is also beautiful and spa and wellness like. So um, we'll be building up some resource on that and maybe producing a card on arrival just to reiterate reiterate what's going on there's wonderful um videos going around as well Kempinski have done a beautiful video of what it's like to arrive in a hotel and we'd love that to develop into a spa as well um back of house obviously your training posters reminders at sinks and so on um and really just looking at the road ahead and we're very lucky that we have thought leaders such as sue harmsworth um, who we joined a call um, about two weeks ago now, there was 630 people on the call. And I honestly can't tell you how, how inspiring the community and the warmth and Sue's presentation and positivity throughout it all. It was an excellent, excellent seminar. But just to summarize it, the keys to success, the key to success as Sue felt was the upcoming availability of cheap, fast COVID testing being perhaps a prick test on the finger that could, um, give us understanding of people immediately if they had it. Um, hospital grade cleaning, hygiene, sterilization of equipment and PPE. Um, Sue was very strong on no discounting that we need to justify the rate by hygiene measures um, and investment. And certainly in terms of capability and capacity when we go back, you know, if anything, once we get a grip of this, rates might even go up and we're not to be afraid of that either once we understand demand. Um, the demographic change, very interesting how Sue um, nailed it, that there will be a decline in the older and the vulnerable, but the growth will live in the um, kind of under 40s market. Um, very much about slimming down the menu, less appetite for massage and facial beauty will increase. Online retail, we must all take advantage. Local community, this is the focus. Wellness memberships, supper clubs. Let's get them talking about 360 degree wellness. Um, medical spas do have a huge advantage in terms of clinical aesthetics. I suppose they already inspire confidence in terms of hygiene and wearing PPE. Um, upskilling our therapists, developing empathy, which is such, such an interesting development and certainly how you train and develop that is an interesting question um, on the emotional side. Uh, there's also the, the future proofing, the online training, lifestyle, preventable disease, contraindications, SOPs, serious training on that for the therapist. And then in the long term, building immunity, lung function, breath work. Um, and all in all, it was, it was an hour seminar, but it was it was very inspiring. You know, just to barging in there. Um, yeah. Interesting on the menu. Yes. Spa and, and salon operators would be needing to look at A, obviously demand, B, what is perhaps the safest treatments, but also to look at ideally mix that in with what is profitable. Mm. Um, you mentioned there quicker treatments or it has been mentioned. Um, 
um, it is vital for people to look down at look at their menus, not just for um, what is the safer treatments, but also what will actually work within the new environment coming out. Yeah, I mean, you're you're balancing appetite with profitability with capacity. So there's there's a couple of layers to it, but in in terms of doing it safely, I mean, treatments being in a closed room and understand like every room is different where you have a massage. Some rooms are tiny with low ventilation and this is a respiratory disease. So air quality is gonna be very important and, and really running through your risk assessment and detailing out where you are vulnerable. And then where you're not vulnerable and you feel confident, it's about wearing the correct PPE to protect yourself and the guest and, and, and doing the treatments that can be done and that are profitable, as you said. What do you think about this? Um, I think in Ireland, it's the same as UK, that everybody is pushing the two meter rule. In Germany, it's one and a half meters. In France, I'm told only today, I might have got it wrong, excuse me if I have, it's a meter. It is, you, know, you hear that the two meters was very arbitrary. Certainly if I sneezed at you, it could hit you four or five meters away. Um, um, what, what would you say for that, particularly on smallest bars and salons? I'm going to let Anita take that one because she's quite passionate about it. So you go for Anita. it, Anita. Thanks for that, Peggy. Um, I think that we might end up with a one metre. Um, I think that the, in the Irish guidelines that were just released this week, they did mention that where it wasn't possible that workers' desks could be one metre. So I don't know if anybody noticed that, but, you know, that could extend to your nail bars and and other stations as well. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of safeguards you can put in place to allow us to, to move forward with the one meter, you know, like the, um, the, the, the disclaimer before the, the guest arrives in the salon or in the spa uh, introducing PPE. But, but I think that, um, you know, that, that there is a few bodies in Ireland um, and potentially over the world pushing for an acceptance of the one meter in order for reasonable business continuity, the restaurants and so restaurants and the hotels are pushing. I've, I've got two ladies, one Christine Clinton, an Irish woman, but of course, as you know, she's based in Philadelphia at the moment. And she says she has practices in the States and, and in Dublin, and she has a huge wait list for her massage. So good she's, for you. I'm not surprised, Christine. Well done. Well done. And I think yeah. the, Ma Marisa Dimitriadis in South Africa also said that her clients um, have, have those who are getting in touch are very much reaffirming their, their want need to be massaged. I was surprised yeah. in Hong Kong where originally beauty led, led the, the treatment choice and this time it was massage leading and then facials and then beauty. And she was surprised herself and she was delighted because the power of touch is at the center of everything we do. So to eliminate that would break all our hearts. So I think sharing these positive stories is really important and making people feel confident and not afraid because fear, fear will mean you stand still. Right now you have to keep listening, keep learning, keep reading, keep now, moving. Ladies, we um, officially, we can run over a little bit. We've only got five minutes left. <gasps> is, there, is there, do you want to, do you want to, um, is there any particular elements of the remaining part of the presentation you particularly want to highlight? And 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 before you answer that, will it be? I've had a question from Adele Haymans. I'm sorry, Adele, if I've got it wrong. Haymans, will you will you share this presentation? Will it be available? The presentation won't be available, but what will we're if you go to our website and come onto our database, our blueprint will be. It's being formatted at the moment, and it's going live at the end of the week. So the blueprint will be available to everyone, and then for our That's members, association website. Yeah, but for our members, then we will have um, the business continuity. So to supplement the blueprint, there's the business continuity workbook, risk assessment, free documentation audit with our partner. Um, there'll be communication templates, eco lab, diversity, online training modules for hygiene, um, guidelines for pool and thermal, um, recommendations for sterilization equipment. And Gary and he have put, two, put together two brilliant slides for this presentation. But unfortunately, my techie skills meant I went to an old presentation. So I'm sorry, Mehmet, for all your work, but that will go out to everyone um, in our membership. And then efforts of sourcing. I mean, Anita and I are both 
very passionate about people getting back to work, feeling confident, feeling equipped most of all. So we're actually sourcing um, high grade, low cost PPE ourselves, which we will uh, sell on to members at not for profit at cost plus shipping. So we're doing everything we can. And we're, you know, the, the response from people on this crusade has just been incredible and we're very grateful and we, and we really would like to thank them. So in terms of Peninsula, Premier Software, Laura and Rob, beautiful jobs, Maria, Mehmet at Gary Eni, Janice at Ecolab and Brian at Brian Mullins, we say thank you to all of you and everyone else who wants to reach out and join us on this, we'd be delighted to welcome you. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Now, ladies, I mean, what do you, what do you feel? I, um, we've had some questions. Do you think it's safe to use a sauna or a hammam or a, even a swimming pool in, in, this, in this environment? Would you, how yeah, would you so I think that your biggest challenge there is social distancing, but the World Health Organization does have guidelines on the chlorination. Um, and, you know, it's not dissimilar to the, you know, the, the existing viruses. So I think that the best reference point is... Um, probably the World Health Organization for that, in terms of the, the level of disinfection that's needed. And I would also say Sue Harmsworth was very interesting about it going back to the olden days when she was at Greyshot, where these were bookable treatments and it, and it would take you back to what Neve O'Connell said in Hong Kong with the pool being a bookable experience that you book an hour in the pool and you arrive and you manage numbers that way. So it might be for individual use and and, and some say that actually the virus doesn't like saunas particularly. Is how that... it's responding in heat and humid air. No, we don't have the data. Like, we're, and, and to be honest, Mark, it's kind of something we're going to look to to delving into in the next section. Right now, our heart and soul is behind getting people back to work in revenue generating treatments. And the pool and sauna piece where we don't have a solid ground just yet, we're waiting. So. Fine. Um, what do you see you need to be careful in that space because there's so many different, you know, to verify the information. And I think everything should be medical led when it comes to these type of guidelines, because there is so much speculation. Um, sorry, Mark, I cut you off. No, no, I'm, I've been, Christine is saying that there's some data shared on the Global Wellness Institute. So um, um, there could be a source for people. Um, yeah. What do you think about testing your staff? Um, should spas test their staff? Um, and, and a second part of that question, um, how can, we haven't really touched on spa, staff in, in team members in this presentation, how can you make them feel safe? Or two questions there in one regarding staff. Um, I think that's, uh, that's, that's a huge factor with with your staff returning to work, you know, there is a consideration around workplace wellness. And, and I would suggest to maybe look at uh, looking at an employee assistance program in the workplace so that you do have that resource available for them. Um, in, in relation to testing in Ireland, for example, you know, the level of transmission is low. It's suppressing all the time. I think by the time we open, the, the risk would be very low but it certainly would be a consideration, you know, if we did see a second wave um, to mitigate the risk and to ensure that, you know, we're, we're in good shape to, to continue trading. But again, they're, they're, that's changing all the time. There's different tests coming out. And, um, but, but I wouldn't be against it, but I don't think it'd be necessary in Ireland where we're going to be when we open up initially. Okay. I, I see that. And aside from the obvious health, hygiene, safety, are there any, has this produced from you or the members any, any other ideas to boost the guest experience when we come back? Is there any other wow factors or any, anything else that we've thought about in this time that, that can make the, in somehow enhance the guest experience as opposed to them feeling it's going to be like a hospital? I think the guests, I think I think we're badly missed at this time. And I think when Sue Harmsworth speaks about therapist empathy, I don't think there's any wow factor here, Mark. I think it comes down to genuinely connecting with people again and being looked after in a safe environment. And, and I go back to the power of touch. Michelle Hammond has coined the phrase, the power, you, you can't replace it and time with people. But I also think we'll pivot in some ways 
there will be non-touch. There'll be a buildup of, of, of coming to the spa for stress management and nutritional and lung function and overall health and preventative health. So a lot, I, I look to Sue Harmsworth a lot in her slide, it lives in there. But I, the wow factor for me is simply minding, minding our guests, minding our customers and um, showing them. What can, I'm changing tack it late. What can we do more in, if one believes, I know not everybody does, that if one believes that the salon spa sector should open as soon as practically possible, how, how can we do more, do you think, in, in Ireland to get that point across as a, as a, as a profession, as an industry, to, to make representation better to government? How, how do you think we can do more, aside from the good work you're already doing? Um, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's providing the risk assessments and making sure that they're comprehensive, um, you know, in Ireland, for example, the biggest consideration is the obvious healthcare, um, the hospitals and the nursing homes. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they're not thinking of us, but I think that we need to probably really provide the, the continuity plan and the confidence that, um, you know, we're, we're going to move forward and there's not going to be a risk to public health and so on. But, you know, it's, it's really, I think that, I suppose this is unprecedented. And I mean, there's, you know, there's a number of sectors from the hospitality to our own to, you know, everybody's anxious to get back to work and to, you know, uh, to uh, get people back into their, their jobs. But I think, um, Peggy, did you have anything you wanted to add to that point? I just would say in terms of government, we're, we fall between two stools because we're not a hair salon, which is listed in the roadmap. And within hotels, our social distancing is different. It's, it's, we, we can't, adhere to it so I think it's so important that we appear robust that we've thought of everything we possibly could that we've equipped everyone to be confident and therefore government will see us as prepared and ready and have the PPE what's required and and I suppose it's very where we struggle is we don't want to take PPE from the front line but we we you know it's just getting a measure and a balance around it all um in terms of communicating with customers, i.e. the end client, what do you think spas and salons should be doing now, th this, this moment? What, what, would you, what would you would be, what, what should, what's the feedback that you've had? What should we be doing now to, to, in our communication with clients? I think we're possible to keep in touch with your clients, you know, particularly your older clients that don't have the, the access to the, the social media and all these outlets that we have. Um, you know, I think that um, if you're not online, you need to get online. Um, I'm not sure what other countries are doing, but Ireland has the um, a grant for the websites and, and that expires this week. So that's really important to, to take advantage of that. Um, you know, and to explore and to be creative and to look at, you know, how you can uh, do virtual consultations and facials for your clients. And even if it's like breathing exercises, but I think that 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 people won't forget that. And, and, you know, I think that if we remember our clients now that when we reopen that, you know, they're, they'll be good to us in return. I also think you can reach out to your VIPs and your trusted loyal clients and begin to survey them in the nicest way possible as to, you know, even some places are building up waiting lists and not getting an understanding for the, the type of treatments that there's appetite for and just connecting and making it interactive. I, you know, since speaking with Neve in the Rosewood, I'm following them on Instagram or whatever, and I'm seeing the interactivity and the Instagram lives and how people have grown in confidence. And, you know, even Mark, myself, if you'd said to me two months ago, you're going to be doing this, I wouldn't have thought I had it in me. So it's, it's amazing how people have changed, how they've pivoted, they've grown in confidence. Yes, we've all had moments where we're like literally paralyzed by this and thinking, what is the future? But the, the sense of community and the sense of support and even being invited on here, Mark, thank you so much. It, it's just been incredible. So I think we just keep moving forward. We keep finding our way. Well, um, I have a couple of questions on the chat and um, Bevin Mal Maloney um, um, from Galway, who has a le an electrolysis clinic. And she says, look, we work closer than a metre. I'm prepared to use visors and high grace masks. Do you think this is okay? Do you, it's probably a little unfair, but what's, what's your take to that kind of a question? 
I think there's a number of factors. I think that you have to mitigate the risk as much as possible by completing very detailed consultation before the, the client comes in. You know, they'll have to complete a declaration, which would include those questions like, you know, that, that, that there's nobody in the household with COVID and you're just kind of lowering the risk all the time. And when the, the customer arrives, you know, when you're, you're working at that close proximity, you, you will have to, to wear a PPE, but you know, um, you need to, to perform your own risk assessment as well and, and look at the, the size of your treatment areas and you know, the age of your client as well, that the clients that are a bit more risk adverse um, and you know, make, make the decisions best placed on that. I just, um, on, on the fact from you, Peggy, some mo notion of a VIP list, um, uh, Marie says, chatted to that with her clients in the US, I'm sorry, in, the, in South Africa. And I know also that a couple of UK salon owners have just reached out just to, and were surprised and heartened by you know, that, that do people still want us? And actually oh. we were inundated, inundated yeah. with their clients, um, not all of course, but so many clients coming back and say, yes, we do. and. When can I book? Can you remember me on the to, on the on the yeah. to be the first one? So I think yeah. it's a, it's it's morale boosting for all of us. It, it's it's morale boosting, but it's also a pulse check. It's really um, interesting gonna... because, because we we don't know what they want and need as much as they know. So it you know ask them, touch base with them, the ones you trust. And you know I've even seen people open up, you know, waiting lists on on, on Instagram and Facebook, and you know. We have to be brave as well. We have to be cautious. We have to be educated. We must use all the resources, all the checklists, all the resources. But we must, we must engage with our customers. No, exactly. I've got a, I've got a note from Jean Guy de Gabriac, who's, who's our co-host with the World Wellness Weekend on, on this week, and he was saying that Dr. Mark Cohen, um, yeah. he has got scientific evidence to support the use of heat to treat COVID nineteen. So Good. we can share that. Um, it's on. It's on the chat in the in the panels there. Um, that was on this morning. I heard it was brilliant. Yeah, well um, done, Pegin, Anita. We we need to sort of bring this to a close. Do, do you have any final word, um, um, Anita? Do you have any, um, and then Pegin? I will end on a huge thank you to everybody that is supporting us and please reach out if you've any support to offer um, and as for all of the spa operators and therapists you know um, you can keep in touch with us on our social media channels and on our uh, website and we're here to help so for as long as uh, as we have the, the time on our hands we're we're here to help so please reach out. Uh, I'm seeing all the names come up on the screen, Nula Wolf. It's just so lovely to have you all. And it's so great, Mark, that you facilitated this. And all I can say is both Anita and I are growing in strength and confidence and our tech skills are getting there. And we're just delighted that you've the patience and the trust in us. So thank you so much. And thank you very much, Mark, really. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's real pleasure to get the view from Ireland. I think in um, um, Ireland, from a UK perspective, has come out to this very well, and um, we've no we've noticed what's coming out um, seems seems very organised um, um, from 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 the country. So, thank you very much. Looking forward to seeing you soon in person, hopefully. Um, Definitely. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll end um, um, this the panel now. I'm, I'm you know I must announce the next panel at 5 p.m. UK time. Look forward to seeing you all there. Um, Pegin, Anita, thank you both very much. All the best to you. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.